Hello my lovely students. Today we're going to talk about similes, which are actually my favourite little bit of literature technique. First of all, what is a simile? Well, it's a smile with an eye. Get it? I, I, simile. Yeah, okay, moving swiftly on. A simile is a comparison of two things using the phrase like or as when it something, for example. Similes are used to compare people, objects or events to other things in order to create imagery. Okay, let's get technical before we go on. Former English teacher here. There are several different parts of a simile. The topic or tenor, the event, the comparator, how very American sounding, and the vehicle. So if we have this basic little simile here, which I made up, it's not from Homer. The water surged like a boiling cauldron. First of all, the topic or tenor is the subject of the comparison, the thing that you're going to compare to something else to try and help other people visualise. Then you have the event, the action of the topic or tenor, which focuses that comparison. Here the water is surging, it's bubbling away. Then you have the comparator, which in a simile is like or as or as when or even than. You're comparing something to something else and that also indicates to the reader or the audience that the vehicle is coming up. The thing that you were comparing the topic or tenor to, the object of the comparison. Hopefully something that your audience is going to be able to understand. When you look at a Homeric simile, you're not just looking at any regular a simile where there is one simple idea really and the imagination does most of the work. A Homeric simile however gives you a lot more information to deal with. The water surged like a boiling cauldron having been left unattended on the fire. It bubbles and froths so fiercely that it overflows and soaks the floor beneath. What on earth is all this additional information for? Well, to try and create an even clearer image in the mind of the audience or the reader, you have additional detail that extends the effect. For example, this bit here, the cauldron has been left unattended on the fire. It makes it identifiable as an unexpected event. We also have in addition things like sound imagery, the bubbling, that onomatopoeic sound here, and also some visual imagery. It froths so fiercely. And then you've also got further detail detail extending the effect and here we've got foreshadowing if the water surging is soaking the floor beneath then that's not a good thing so maybe something bad is going to happen after this simile for the people who are experiencing it in the text. So overall, a Homeric simile is an extended simile that intensifies the effect of the in comparison for the audience with additional imagery. So what were the similes used for in Homeric epic? Well, the original audience for the Homeric poems would have been normal people, farmers, traders perhaps, most of whom would never have been to war or perhaps traveled very far. So the poet telling the story to an audience who is sitting there trying to focus on what they're being told and can't necessarily imagine what's happening in the story because they don't have experience of it, are being allowed to identify with the thing they haven't experienced by means of another thing which they have. And that's going to make it much more satisfying and exciting for them. And they're not going to get distracted and get bored and maybe stop listening, which is also a really important thing when you're telling a story out loud to a very large group of people who maybe also are getting a bit hungry. Now, I'm going to lay some stats on you, but just my regular disclaimer, I am dyscalculic. I have checked this data several times to ensure it is correct. Um, but if you would like to do some counting of similes of your own, the excellent article I used here is a classification of the similes of Homer by Professor Eliza G. Wilkins from 1920. Yes, that is over 100 years ago. Yikes. And it is freely available on the JSTOR website. You just have to make yourself an account and you can view that for free. But what I used that article for was to look at the simile topics in Homer. Now, I've just said that things they didn't understand, the audience have described to them in comparison with things they do understand. A whopping 66% of all the similes across the Odyssey and the Iliad are about the natural world. Things that they would all hopefully have experienced. And 25% are about the human world. And that's really interesting given, you know, they're all 
humans and everything, probably, but not everyone has had the very same experiences. We've also got a little 9% here of comparisons to gods. It's not always hubristic to compare someone to a god, but it's certainly going to give a great big dramatic effect. And actually, if we look at a breakdown of these similes across the Iliad and the Odyssey, we see that in fact there are a huge number of similes in the Iliad compared to the Odyssey. 360 Iliad similes compared to 132 Odyssey similes. Again, my math might be off here, but you can count yourself, but that's basically about right. And that's probably because of the topic. The Iliad is about warfare and death and dying and pride and gaining kudos through killing other people and, and taking stuff. Anyway, the Odyssey is about a man trying to get home. And yes, there's some monsters and stuff in it, but it's still a much more personal experience. So in the Iliad, you have 71% of your similes of the natural world. 31 similes are about lions. And that makes a lot of sense when you think about fighters on the battlefield as if they're ravening for blood. 22% are about the human world and 7% are about comparisons to gods. And that's mostly Ares, the god of the violence of war, which again makes sense in a, in a poem about warfare. Whereas in the Odyssey, there are 31 bird similes, which again makes sense in a poem about a lot of traveling probably. But there's more about the human world, 32% in fact, compared to 22% in the Iliad, which again suggests this much more personal experience. Just so you know, the comparisons to gods here are mostly about Aphrodite and Artemis when he's talking about women. They're either sexy or they're not sexy, very virginal. The imagery of the similes also helps us understand life in the ancient world. For example, just using these three screenshots from the article by Eliza G. Wilkins, you can see the, the great detail in which she went to classify all of these similes. But you can also see really interesting stuff. For example, when you're threshing beans and chickpeas beating against a winnowing fan gives us some information about the kind of foods that they grew and ate and how they got them. A winnowing fan is used to get the lovely fruits away from the chaff in which they grow. We've also got men contending over a boundary line, for example. That means they're having a good old fight about whose land belongs to whom. And let's face it, if you live in the countryside, that happens a lot even today. And also there is a whole section on women. And that does suggest that even though there's, okay, there's like six here, basically. There's, there's six areas in which the majority audience men might have understood about women, but they are still slightly represented. But look at how they're represented. They're captive widows or they're a maiden in bright attire or they're women unacquainted with battle because, you know, they are defenseless and possibly mad. And one of them's an oven woman, which I think means she does the cooking. So we learn a little bit about the role of women from these similes. So let's get to some examples. I have picked out my favourite three similes. And the first one is from Iliad Book 11. As bands of reapers work towards each other on a rich man's land, cutting their swathes to meet across a field of barley, and the crop falls handful after handful to the ground, so the Trojans and Achaeans leapt at each other and cut men down. The reapers are the warriors. They're moving towards each other from either side of the battlefield in this case. The swathes of golden barley, tall and ripe, being cut down are the young men in their bronze armour, tall and in their prime, killed by their enemies. The sound of the scythes cutting through the corn is, well, you could probably imagine. Ugh. But you can see how very detailed this Homeric simile is. You get visual imagery, sound imagery, but also by comparing something that involves both nature and the act of farming, which is something you can really only do in peacetime, you really do get a great juxtaposition between peace and war, which exacerbates the horror of war that is being shown in this particular simile. Another simile comes from Iliad Book 3. When the warrior Menelaus saw Paris stepping out in front, he felt the joy of a lion that has come across a great carcass, an antlered stag or a wild goat. He eats it greedily, even though the running hounds and the strong young huntsmen try to drive him away. Menelaus is the lion, strongest predator, brave and strong. Paris 
the guy he's about to go up against who stole his wife, is the already dead corpse of a stag or goat. Yes, that's pretty harsh, but he is so inferior to Menelaus that he's already dead before he's gone up against him, and he's no lion. He's a stag or a wild goat, he's the prey, okay? Menelaus feels joy to fight Paris, who gave him Eidos by stealing his wife. Nothing, not even the other Trojans, who are represented by the Huntsman, can stop him. And hopefully by now, if you've listened to my other videos, or even watched my other videos, you know how that deal goes down. Finally, another Iliad simile, because it, the Iliad has the best similes, let's face it. Patroclus came up and stabbed him with his spear in the right side of his jaw, piercing on through the teeth, then gripped the spear with it and swung him over the chariot rail, as when a man sitting on a rocky point hauls a fish out of the sea with his line and bright bronze hook. So Patroclus hauled him out of the chariot, his mouth gaping round the spear, and thrust him down on his face. Patroclus is the man on the rocky point, the fisherman, using his spear, or possibly a line and a hook, to catch the enemy. And like a fish, the enemy is a source of wealth. Not food, but kudos, the praise he's going to get for having killed this enemy. Patroclus is in an Aristea, a red-misted killing spree, and so this amazing feat of strength of catapulting his enemy out of the chariot on this pivot of his spear, with the ease of a fisherman catching his fish, really emphasises Patroclus's killing prowess. Patroclus is on fire in terms of killing other people. And again, that hunting, fishing, peacetime event being contrasted with something in warfare really does emphasise the goriness. So hopefully we've got some really good ideas of simile from this. But I just want to take a second to actually talk about the woman who made this whole list of similes that I've used for this video and this comic. She was born in 1877 and died in 1940. And yet all that is known about her is this bit of information here. She has these books, which she wrote well over 100 years ago, and they are reprinted all the time. And yet we don't really know much about her, which I think is a real shame. So perhaps get one of her books, read it, and understand even more about these things we rather take for granted about the ancient world and classical literature. Finally, if you're into similes and you're on Twitter, you may well enjoy the account Homer the Bot, who puts one of the Homeric similes out every day for you to look at as a prediction of how your day will go. And look, like I said, many lions. Thanks so much for listening to and watching this video. If you like that, be sure to subscribe or catch me on Instagram or Twitter for more delicious classics related content. Bye and have a really great day.